following interview was conducted with Marilyn Forney for the Virginia Kelly Carnes Archives and Special Collections Research Center. It takes place on October 5, 2012 in the Swaim Instruction Center on the fourth floor of the Humanities Library. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Welcome, Marilyn. My name is Marilyn Forney. I was born on March the 5th, 1927 in South Bend, Indiana. Actually, I was born in Mishawaka, Indiana. My mother and father, uh, my father at that time had a Lyric radio distribution. And by the time 1929 rolled around, of course I was only three years old, he lost everything he had. And my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother's mother and father, my father's mother and father were now dead. But my grandmother, who was a very astute business manager, had managed to go stand in line during the Depression when the run came on the bank. And my father said, as many people did, that nothing was going to happen. Uh, well, he lost everything. And as a result, we were just like everyone else. Uh, my parents were very frank about the problems of the Depression. The lady next door had a, a sewing, opened a sewing business. Her husband had to go on WPA, and this is the mother and father of my best childhood friend. And uh, everyone felt so degraded. Uh, I felt that in growing up, my parents, we had the happiest time. Uh, my mother had two sisters that still survived. And my grandmother was a strong little dynamo. <laughs> I don't think she ever was taller than four foot ten. I have no idea, but she was miniature in my book. So we uh, worked together as a family. My mother, much to my father's humiliation, my father opened a gas station. My mother, much to his humiliation, had to seek a job. She had, uh, my grandmother at that time was in the supervision uh, capacity at Wilson Brothers tie and shirt manufacturing. She was a gifted seamstress. And of course she taught all her daughters to sew, but none of them <laughs> responded. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we moved on living in the same house, which happened to be immediately across the street from Riley High School. Our life moved on very convenient when I was in high school, but when I was in grade school, I had to walk to J.M. Studebaker. And at that point in my life, I was walking four miles a day. We were on the absolute border for Studebaker School. If you crossed the street north, you would go to James F. M. Monroe <laughs> Elementary School. There was no lunch uh, at the school. And nobody, there wasn't even a lunch room. Nobody ever carried on lunch. Did you go but home for lunch? I had to go home for lunch. Oh. I walked four miles every day. Wow. <laughs> but I think that that's probably enough. I was very good student and very motivated. And it was not because my, um, anybody was pushing me. And I found that to be true with my husband. I don't know, but yet some of the kids that I played with just weren't motivated, you know? I don't know what makes, what motivates people. Your, pa your parents didn't push you, but did you have favorite subjects? Math, I mm -hmm. loved math, I loved English, I loved Latin, I was all in high school, and I had terrific teachers. This was at the end of the era when you had to um, be single and teach, mm -hmm. and all these grand old maids you know, I don't. I didn't have a single married. We yes, we had one married teacher, but she was a widow. You had to be single. So, 
we, it was during the war. The war was declared, of course, in 41. And so they speeded up everything in school, in high school. We then were running three semesters a year. So, not three semesters, I guess two and a half. I think they had two weeks off. But we went to, uh, I graduated in August 1943, and two weeks later, or maybe one week, I was at Purdue. How did you land there? Well, I had several scholarship offers, and I really wanted to go to the University of Chicago. But my mother was very opposed because Robert Hutchinson was the president of the University of Chicago, and my mother always said he was pinko. Pinko? <laughs> Which meant communist in her Oh, book. no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so she said no. So anyway, I uh, had a full ride to Kalamazoo, Indiana. And, but I came to Purdue because I wanted to teach science. I thought that would be great. I suppose I had aspirations to be Marie Curie, but I got to Purdue. And in the meantime, off and on, I had lived with my grandparents on the farm. My mother had gone to work, as I said, in a factory making clothes for the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which existed at that time. She was 10th in line at that point, and she got the job because she knew how to put flies in men's pants. That's tricky. <laughs> well, I never <laughs> learned. Well, anyway, I got to Purdue, and at that point, you used to sit for English 32. I don't know what they even offer it anymore, but this is where you could opt out of an English course. And you wrote an essay. And uh, they always stood up there and said, now look at the right and look at the left, because only one of you is going to be left. And uh, apparently I did very well in the essay. So I took my one three-hour English course and my took one that what was freshman chemistry. We had two different chemistry courses. We had chemistry for science and we had chemistry for engineering. Well, I took the chemistry for science course and ended up with a six, which was the top grade in both of those courses. And while I was there, I thought, I don't know that I really want to be a science teacher because having been poor but happy, we, it was a happy life. Uh, you know, you were just as poor, but so was so was everyone else, and it was such a strain. I remember in the summers when I would go to my grandparents to spend the summer with them, that they would have people marching up and down the road right in front of their farm. My grandmother sold her house in South Bend. My grandfather's business contracting was kaput. And uh, they sold their farm and moved, I mean, sold their house in South Bend and moved back to the uh, farm. And it was just like those pictures you see that uh, Dorothy Draper does. She was a very famous photographer of the Depression. I think that was her name. I saw people pushing wheelbarrows, walking along the road. I mean, it makes an impression. You can be six years old, you can be seven years old, and you say, what are they doing there? You know, where are they going to go for the night? Oh, God. And my mother, uh, we lived probably in South Bend, we lived probably six blocks from the railroad. A very, you know, very modest middle class neighborhood. Uh, we lived six blocks from the railroad and every so often there'd be somebody knocking at our back door uh, looking for something to eat. And my mother would uh, feed them. But first before, she always made them sit on the back step and when anyone came to the door, she made me run over to Mrs. Henry's house <laughs> to say that I'm feeding somebody here on the back step. Because she was fearful or? Well, I said, what do I know as a kid? You yeah. know, what did I know? I think she was just being safe. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the only telephone in the neighborhood, so Mrs. Henry ran her sewing business through our house they wanted to call Mrs. Henry, they had to call our house, or she came over and called us. Two of her clients 
ride around the neighborhood. One of them jumped out the window of the J and M building in South End. You know, it was. But your, par as, your parents did okay during your depression. Well, they didn't. They were six months behind in their rent. Their rent was only twenty five dollars a month. But, but you could still feed other people who needed. Well, we always did. We had my uh, mother's sister living on the farm at Culver. And so for food, we were not pressed. Although I must say, during the worst of the depression, we didn't have any meat to speak of. I have eaten enough lima beans that <laughs> I haven't touched a lima bean since then. I think my mother's favorite dish was stewed tomatoes with lima beans and garlic from my father. <laughs> oh, that, that's all right. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, I've had a very good childhood. So despite those hard times, it was a good That's time right. Well, let's get back to going to Purdue. Now I'm at Purdue. When I came to Purdue, the ratio was 12 to 1. That was every girl's dream, I can tell you. <laughs> and it was really fun. Uh, and yet, I, during that first semester, or half semester, whatever you called, we were then on, we then went into three semesters a year, three full semesters a year. During that first semester, I was really thought, there, uh, I found out, since I loved chemistry and math, and there were other girls in Wood Hall, only two or three, I can remember three, that said, let's be engineers. And that didn't affect me so much. I just decided that I would rather be, it, it, chemical engineering paid the most on the campus. Hmm. So I said, I'll be a chemical engineer. So I enrolled and or changed schools. And from then on, it was a tough going tough going because it was a really rigorous course. And Three semesters a year and the boys or men, whatever you wanted to say at that time, that we didn't have many returning vets. They started coming back that had been damaged during the war in 44. We started having a lot of vets return at the time in 43 and 44, early 44. Really 45 is when they really became came back um, they, were, they had a work ethic you wouldn't believe. I mean, it wasn't a, you were pressed to keep up with the group. They really had a work ethic. I mean, they had seen it. They were there first time, as I was too, because I don't think anybody, very few people had mothers or fathers that came to Purdue at that time, unless they were in agriculture that had been in Purdue or been to college, as mm -hmm. far as that's concerned. All right, so I think the next thing that probably happened to me was I <laughs> met this boy <laughs> who was really smart, and <laughs> he was lots of fun. So I thought, hmm, I was, I had promised myself I'd never going to get married, you know, I was going to have this wonderful career, be this, be that, do that. It's pretty radical for back then, right? In the uh, 1940s? Not so much. I think, I hate to say it, I think if you were in home ec, you really were shopping. <laughs> uh huh. In engineering, you it? had to, uh, I, I was such an independent person. I never joined a sorority. I, I just thought, well, I, I have better use of my time. Mm -hmm. uh, How? How was it having all male classmates? Did you feel like you were treated the, equally? They were, they were fine. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely fine. There was prejudice among the teachers. And when the servicemen came back, uh, largely they were committed. There was no play among them. You know, I mean, we were all playful. Not playful, that would be, we were all sort of relaxed. Mm -hmm. But they had a tremendous work ethic, and all the rest of us had to work to keep up. Mm -hmm. For example, we were in chemistry class one time and had, uh, whether it was physical chemistry or something, we were in a lab one time, 
and uh, one of the oxygen tanks went off, Whoop, or w one tank went off. I'll tell you, you could tell who the servicemen were. They flopped to the floor. Is that and the rest, right? Oh. And the rest of us were standing up there looking, what's going on here, you know? How wow. dumb could you be? <laughs> you should have flopped to the floor, too. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, there were lots of things that happened that they had in sight. My husband tells in particular the fact that he uh, uh, was assigned to uh, a um, surveying class and two CBs and this kid wet behind the ears from Chicago <laughs> came out and they were all in the same surveying class and of course the CBs had surveyed all over Guadalcanal <laughs> and all over the Pacific <laughs> and Bob said I just stood there and they did all the work. What's a CB? A CB was a construction uh, in the Coast Guard. I don't remember. They were called CBs, S-E-A-B-E-E-S, you know, CBs. Oh, okay. I don't know what they were. It was like Navy V-12 and Navy V-5 and the ASTP, which this campus was swarming with them. Very sad, though, that many of those kids that filtered in and out were lost during the war, especially 43, I think they lost you know, that first football team, Tony Buckowitz, and a lot of those people. I don't remember their names anymore, but I knew a lot of them. They were, we were all in the same class once I went in September to the engineering. What, what, what about campus life when you were on campus? What did you do for fun when you weren't studying? What did I do for fun? Well, there were lots of things to do for fun. They had, uh, in my freshman year, believe me, I had an, I had dates. I'd have three dates on Sunday. Once I wow. got into engineering, you know, it, it was a different world. Morning, though. noon, and night, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, there, were, uh, there were so many things. I worked at WBAA. Is I didn't ever, I never was paid, you know. I ran for student government, and I was elected on the student government, you know, it's just, you did the normal things. What did you do at WBAA? I was an announcer. Okay. Did you have I a think regular it was John time? Del Camp. Oh no, you, and you know, they were just, uh, it was just nice people. You'd go over there and you worked there and you'd have a program. Maybe you were on a regular program, maybe you were doing, you know, music or mm -hmm. something, you know. That's WBAA. We just went there. You don't know Faith Wayne Pearson, do you? Hmm? Faith Wayne Pearson? Never heard the name. No. I know she was an engineer and she worked at WBAA too, so that must have been the Well, thing to do. I don't remember any. Let's get back to about my junior year when Lillian Gilbreth came to the campus and we had these daily sessions with her. As I remember it, she was a visiting professor, and she would come for a three-month stint, and then they doubled up for her classes and everything. And uh, she stayed, I don't know, I, I assume uh, that the head of Wood Hall would move out and she would stay at Wood Hall. I really don't know. Hmm. I didn't much care where she spent the night because she got up at six o'clock in the morning. I just felt that she was somewhere. But she really, I would like to say she could have been a mentor. Uh, but she was in the evening in particular, not in the morning, not at noon. We didn't eat it with her at noon. But the engineering students, the women engineering students, and I remember by that time I was a sophomore or a junior. I don't remember what year that she was doing this. And maybe after I left Wood Hall, I wasn't involved. But there were only six May of us. May I have us. your attention? It's now 5 o'clock and the periodical stacks will close at 5.30 p.m. The library will close at 6 o'clock. Thank you. But uh, I've lost my train of thought. So it was Lillian, and she, you didn't eat lunch with her. We certainly didn't eat lunch with her. I don't remember what we did. But at dinner, she would sit at the head of the table, and I remember that the tables only sat 
eight people because I, or ten, because I did work uh, as a waitress uh, there, earning extra money. I only had five dollars a week for spending money, and you had to eat Sunday night dinner out, mm -hmm. and that lasted you. But of course, everything was so cheap. You know, I could go to the movies for twenty-five cents. Wow. Where did you waitress? At Woodhall. Okay. And I used to pick up money. I was a, well, I was a gifted pianist, and uh, I used to pick up money playing for teas, oh. or I you know other things. Um, but she, there was a lot of phone traffic, which was sort of incredible because. One of her kids was always calling her up or somebody during the meal, but she was very calm and very pleasant. And of course, we really didn't know a great deal about her personally until the two kids wrote a book about her called Cheaper by the Dozen, and then it brought everything back because you could see this is really what happened. Uh, <laughs> she had to be calm. Uh, but, for example, in the book it recounts when one of her sons was here, I think one of the kids came here, Frank, I think, I don't remember, but when Frank came, uh, he skipped a class that his mother had taught that day. Apparently he didn't know that she was back on campus. <gasps> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is in the book, I don't remember precisely what it says in the book, but he skipped the class. And uh, so at dinner, she was talking about what happened in class, you know, when she had dinner with him. This was when she had dinner with us, you know. Okay. But uh, she was very kind, but you had to be impressed at how focused she was. She was truly focused. Now, after all of that... Uh, Did you take any... She classes with her? Did she teach? Uh, yes, she taught, I think in mechanical, she taught in industrial engineering. Okay. I was you in chemical, chemical engineering. No, we did not have any classes with her. I did not have any classes with her. Did you have any friends who did? No. No? I didn't know. Uh, I knew one of my friends was Shirley Mateg, who, well, that's probably your married, married name, but she was in civil engineering, Betty Carlson. By this time, I knew probably four or five women engineers, but if there were any more, it wasn't so unusual to think about being an engineer at that time, because uh, the Russians had a great deal of influence in the fact that they were using, because of the terrible devastation of the war, the Second World War, which we were in, uh, they were using women for engineers all mm -hmm. the time. And what you didn't understand was they kept talking about women engineers. What they really meant was train engineers or locomotive engineers. They didn't really stress training as much. And I don't think we understood that. Maybe they had training. Maybe they were teaching child, uh, women in, um, engineering, but I really don't know. What about the Curtis Wright cadets? Did you? Oh, yes. Did you hang out Yes, with I did. We, uh, the whole Wood Hall, when I lived there, it was either the third floor, I think I lived on the second floor, the whole third floor was Curtis Wright Cadets. And uh, I had forgotten about them. <laughs> they were really, they were a much more sophisticated, fast-moving group of girls. They, uh, uh, they worked hard, but they were, they were faster. Yeah. <laughs> and they were hardworking, I mean, I know they were there for a couple of years. How many years were they there? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I know it was an abbreviated stay, and they took a lot of classes. They took a heavy course load. Mm hmm Well, they were more mature. Yeah. Well, yeah. they came from the working world, right? That's correct. Mm-hmm. And then how about when you graduated from Purdue? Well, when I graduated from Purdue, I thought, ah, by that time I'd had my eye on my husband. Yeah, how did you meet him? I met him in class. I met him in physical chemistry. Was he your and classmate? <laughs> we were classmates, that's right. We graduated at the same time. 
As a matter of fact, I held back a semester so I could get him. Oh, my. <laughs> he knows that I could run very fast, and he sort of slowed down. Now, when I graduated, I had three job offers right then. I mean, getting a job, even as a woman, was not a problem. Hmm. There was such a shortage of trained people. Everything was beginning to go up again. But I chose to go back to South Bend to Mishawaka to work for U.S. Rubber because I was going to catch that boy. And uh, I had a job offer from Sun Oil in uh, Marcus Hook and one from Exxon Mobil, or it was Exxon then, uh, down in Curacao, which, you know, I thought living in the Caribbean would be pretty neat. Ooh. But uh, there was no. And when I got my job, interestingly enough, they offered me $175 a month. And I knew, I can't think of his name, but one of the boys, not in my class, but one of them, they hired a new engineer. And uh, he was getting 250 so much as I wanted to stay in Mishawaka or South Bend, because I want to stay close to Bob, or I, uh, I said to them, I said, you know, I know Joe, whatever his name was, is getting 250. I said, I took the same classes. And I said, I made better grades because you had to have a, a B plus average at that time, besides having 149 hours. <laughs> so I said, I, I think that we, oh, they wanted me. So they said, yes, we'll go to headquarters, which were at Passaic, New Jersey. And they came back within the week and said, yes, you will get $250 a month. So this Joe guy, he worked in the same, he worked for the same employer? Yes, correct. Okay. But there was, a, uh, there was discrimination here at Purdue among the professors. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were, were they very helpful, very helpful. And some of them were, you know, aloof. Just, you knew that they were not happy to see a woman in class. Mm -hmm. But some of them were just wonderful. And when you went to their headquarters in New Jersey, how did you get there? Did you fly? I didn't go. No, they... Oh, they talked to them. Yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, How was it for you to approach them like that? Were you nervous? I have a lot of confidence. Nice. I, I'm not intimidated. <laughs> I really wanted that job. <laughs> I didn't want to go to uh, to Marcus Hook. Uh huh. Although Marcus Hook, I ended up in Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> Marcus Hook is the next town up. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And how did you get these job offers? Did you apply for them, or was there? job fairs at Purdue there back were, then? If there were job fairs, I don't remember them. I applied. Uh, and I think sometimes, that's a long time ago. I really don't remember. I remember that when I got, you know, when I found out that they were hiring, that was where I was going to go. Okay. I was very interested in what we were doing. This was developing adhesives. Not that I had any special skill in it, but it was a lot of chemistry that I was particularly interested in. And I thought, you know, I'd like that. They were making coil-on foam, and they were using it in car seats, and they were using it in mattresses. And apparently they didn't have the right idea because Tempur-Pedic now has a corner on the mattress department. Uh, for example, as a development engineer, I had a mattress that I still have, but it was supposed to have been returned to Case, uh, who did a lot of um, Case Institute in Cleveland or wherever it is, who did a lot of testing on things, wear tests, there were a lot of wear test things. Uh-huh. And so did you get was, like a sample or? No, I never, by that time, they were all the coil on phone business. Nobody ever contacted me. Oh. So I still had the mattress. Do you? Really? Yeah. <laughs> So you were interested in that kind of chemistry and that's how you found your job. 
And you started there and the working conditions were pretty comfortable then once you got that equal pay? Well, everyone was nice to me, really nice to me. We had a, a great overall supervisor and there were a group of about six engineers, development engineers in various states, one of whom was smart as a whip. His name was Gene Bessie. He was really smart. Harold Gable was the head, two of whom were, they were just warming the seats. I think that was the reason they were, I, as you look back, as you learn to work with a team here at Purdue, you quickly spot who's able and who has great ability and who doesn't. Hmm. My Purdue education prepared me for a lifetime skills that you, have carried me successfully through my life. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go on because I have to get dressed. I know, okay. Well, you met your husband. You finally ended up snagging him. Yes, I did. We got married the next year. He was, uh, he finished his master's degree and we were only married two weeks when we both decided he ought to get a PhD. Oh. So at that point, I continued working and he, we came back to Purdue in the fall. We got married in April, and I was pregnant. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't going to have babies, but that was a different world. <laughs> and I was pregnant, so I came to work, uh, uh, came back to Purdue, and Frank Martin, who was the chemistry czar, he was the one that decided who was going to make it in freshman chemistry because, Ooh. you know. Gives me the shivers just thinking about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, he, he was, I became a grader for him. And I worked till the birth of our, our first child was born a year after we came back and I worked for him as a grader. In fact, I was in labor and I was grading papers at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And then after that, Professor Shreve, who was head of the department, said, when you have the baby, you know, come work for me. And it, we had a really nice relationship, uh, a good working relationship. I worked for him for about six or seven years, uh, revising his book, Chemical Process Industries. He had hired for people a long time, a series of people that did wrote his papers and wrote his books. And it wasn't uncommon. There were a lot of technical writers, most of them women. Uh, there's a very famous uh, textbook called Perry Engineering, and that was my understanding that the woman wrote that too. And you never thought about getting a PhD yourself? Well, I couldn't. We didn't have any money. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had started to get a master's when we came back, but then uh, once you're pregnant, you you have different that's priorities. True, that's true. So it, it never, uh, you know, it was um, very important that, and of course uh, the campus was full of people putting their husbands through school, you know. Putting hubby through school seemed to be the biggest thing. Hmm. And, and how many kids did you have? Well, we had four children. We had three and then we had a fourth one nine or 10 years later. And two of our sons have died, one from cancer and one from a boating accident. So I have two living children, one of whom is a geologist and a uh, very interesting child, very good child. And the other is our daughter who lives next door to us. We, we live on a farm. Now, what I really want to talk to you about is what Purdue education did for me, and then I'm leaving. Okay. During the time that we had these three children, we moved, we were chemical migratory workers, or migratory chemical workers, mm -hmm. whichever one you wanted to be. And we moved, and I was very interested in uh, segregation and equal opportunity employment and fair housing. These were all social issues that were very obvious to me. To begin with, I had a class 
here at Purdue where I was the only woman, but there was a black man in the class. And the professor said, Mr. Jones, name wasn't Jones, I remember his name, but he said, uh, you'll never get a job. And this <laughs> is at Purdue. This is at Purdue. And I thought to myself, you know, and he picked on me, you know. He didn't pick on me, but I thought that is uh, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. And it was, there was quite a bit of that kind of thing going on here. You know, the even the services weren't integrated. Now, I went to an integrated high school. It wasn't, but you know, that, that just didn't suit me. Were you friends with Mr. Jones at all? Not really. He was in the V12, you know. What's that? Well, that was the Navy, pre-Navy, you know, they were Navy cadets okay. moving through the school, mm -hmm. and they were here. No, I mean, we were all friends. I mean, I, I never really suffered uh, any prejudice, I think, among the students, not to the best of my knowledge. There was a different tenure or tenor uh, when the uh, servicemen returned because they were so no-nonsense. Mm -hmm. I mean, you weren't buddies like you were with everybody else. You know, you're all... You're there to all, get an education. You're all, it was all just, you were all in the same boat. But they had a different perspective, which you can understand. <laughs> they had been shot at. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you got... I you got interested in all those work. things. So I became president of... We moved from Delaware twice and then to North Carolina, Tennessee. And in North Carolina, I became president of the League of Women Voters. I oh, was doing that all that right? kind of thing in eastern North Carolina. Not, it was just a chapter addressing, again, the issues of equal opportunity employment and desegregation. And what year was that? I don't know, when Brown versus whatever it was, okay. whatever that year was. Um, so I, of course, was called by the local newspaper, East Carolina Daily. And what did I think about it? And I said, it's high time. And then I called my husband because I said, Bob, do not be surprised if we have a cross burning on our oh, lawn. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was it was a very different time here in the South. And they were lovely people. I'd love to live back there again. I loved North Carolina. It was really a lovely place to live. But you know, I was very. Then we moved to Tennessee, and this is the time that they had the sit-ins. I think if I hadn't had three children, I probably would have been. Sitting down in Mississippi, mm -hmm. <laughs> I had three children and a husband. I certainly wasn't going to wander around. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have done that. That's just talk. But we, I participated in lunch counter sit-ins, and I have to laugh because my next door neighbor uh, in Tennessee recruited me to go sit at the lunchroom. What you did was you go sat at the lunchroom and then some person, some black person would come in and sit next to you, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't get up and get off, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I did. And you got involved in other volunteer opportunities too. Oh, well, when we came back to Delaware, I was, um, I was on the, um, I was head of the East Side um, Coalition um, using blacks, and I taught at uh, Howard High School, not taught. I did long-term substitutions, only in chemistry and math. And, but when we came back, by this time, I was very interested in housing for the low-income elderly because it was just criminal. We had public housing, which is not, which wasn't good then, mm -hmm. and it's appalling now. Uh, and people didn't have a place, uh, women largely, I would say 80% or 90% of our clientele was women, mostly widows. 
And so I decided, although here's something I could use my education for. I had engineering skills. I could quantify. I could do math. I could do. Uh, I could write. Certainly, I could write grant applications. And you learn to operate as a team at Purdue. You're in unit ops labs. You're operating as a team. You know you can see who the weak team members are and who the leaders are. So we had a bequest, $91,000, to um, Lutheran Church. We belong to Lutheran Church. And uh, the, uh, the consortium was formed by the eight Lutheran churches in Wilmington to address this need with this brand. So I immediately went on this committee. There were two from each church. And it winnowed down to probably six of us that would, myself and five men as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so from that start, I have built, by the time we were into the second building, the, I was in my early 40s, I was probably 42, 43, I don't remember how old I was, but I know in 68, we were really focused on building a building and writing the grant, and I volunteered. And we wrote these grants, they were enormous, still are. Mm. And we were funded. HUD came up with the money. This was a time when they were decided to do something about housing. So we wrote the first grant and we were into building the second building. The first building, I was just on the committee, but the second building, we had two things happen. We had one man had a heart attack and the other man who be had become the leader, they were in their 60s, uh, had a stroke or some kind of a health problem. So I became the head. <laughs> and uh, from then on, it was mine. I was very fortunate in that we had enough money that I did not ever have to work for money. After I left Ball Man, that was the last time I ever got a paycheck. I had the time. I had plenty of household help at this point. And I had a very cooperative husband. And so through the years, we went on to build 13 buildings at a cost of $64 million in Delaware and Southern Chester County, which when Bob retired, we moved across the border to a farm, and which had a thousand, over a thousand sixty-eight apartments. You really made the most of your free time, that's for sure. Well, it was a career path for me. It wasn't free time, believe me, there is no such thing as free time. It was a career path for me, but it gave me a great deal of satisfaction because you have, uh, this is for the very low income, and at that time, at the very beginning, uh, you had to be 62 and not have an income over maybe $5,000 a year has gone up as the years mm -hmm. go over. And most of the people weren't really in pretty good health. It was a heavy time of smoking. It's still, it's tapering off, but elderly people do more smoking except than teenage girls. Uh, that uh, perhaps we had between three or 4,000 people filter through. And they were largely widows. What about prison reform? Were you involved in oh, that? Oh, yes. That was a very interesting, but that wasn't the main focus of my life. This was uh, the governor. I lived next door to the to be governor of the state of Delaware. I did a lot of things. He, I, I served on uh, uh, before I really was devoting full time, and that was full time. I can tell you, to building. I. Uh, I headed the Education Committee of the Human Relations Commission. Uh, I was the first woman on the magistrate selection of the, 
uh, it was a largely political plum to be a magistrate in the state of Delaware. You operated out of a garage, you know. We put that back on the straight and narrow. And prison reform was called the 3S campaign. I don't remember what the 3S has stood for, but trying, and still, I still will support and work with it a little, but nothing. I am involved yet in working, but not like I did before, because I'm, you know, I'm 86, I'll be 87, and uh, I'm still building. I have a 50 unit building I'm doing in Dover, Delaware. Uh, things have changed over the years, the whole program, the whole scope and funding has dried up from the federal level. And I'm also involved in doing a 68 unit building in Kennett Square with the, with the Quakers, which I think has gone down the tube uh, because of the lack of money. But I'm still, I'm still working. And with that, I don't think unless you have something else you want to ask, I, I'm not going to go on. I'm going to go right, have dinner. Just fine. Thank you very much. Is there something else you want to ask me? The only other thing I was going to ask is if there's something that you want me to ask that I ah. didn't mention. We cover everything? Oh, well, if I, I don't know whether I have or not. I haven't right. thought about it. We can always do a, take a version two if, if you think of other things to add. I think I probably covered everything I want to cover. All right. Thank you. <laughs>